for years, we've been brainwashed to think that science is the pinnacle of knowledge. If someone is a scientist, he must know what he's talking about. If something is scientific, it must be looked up to as certain and indisputable. So it's rather surprising that an organization called the Institute of Art and Ideas, or IAI for short, invited a group of well-respected scientists to a series of events where they could explain the situation as it actually is in science. First up was Sabina Hossenfelder, a very well-known presenter of theoretical physics. She was an associate professor at the Nordic Institute for Theoretical Physics in Stockholm before moving to the Frankfurt Institute for Advanced Studies in 2015. She recently joined the Munich Centre for Mathematical Philosophy. She features in the Freedom from Religion Foundation, where there's a quote from her 2014 work, The Rising Star of Science. How come that in a time when the light of science shines so brightly, many people still prefer sitting in the dark? Well, in view of her proudly atheist stand, it came as quite a surprise to hear her say, I think science and religion aren't at war. There are a lot of people who try to play those two out against each other, um, but if you look at what's actually going on in the foundations of physics, that m- then many of the ideas that physicists consider there, especially about um, the question how the universe began, They're basically extensions of some of those originally religious or spiritual ideas. They're just formulated uh, in the form of mathematics. And uh, there are many of those um, religious ideas which are still compatible with, with all we currently know. There are also some things that may forever remain unknown. Um, I already said, um, I believe that ultimately we probably won't be able to figure out how the universe began because it seems to me that this is just a way that science is fundamentally limited. Now, what I find particularly interesting in this part of her presentation is her graphic, which seems to intend to show Jesus or one of his followers beckoning, as if to say, hey, don't forget me. I have a contribution to make on this. Her claim that science and religion are not incompatible seems to signal a major change in thinking. Remember what Richard Lewontin said, that materialism is an absolute, for we cannot allow a divine foot in the door. Even more surprising is the presentation by Eric Weinstein, who has a PhD in mathematical physics from Harvard and defines and conducts the Harvard University's Galileo project. He draws a parallel between physicists and contestants in a guessing game. They're prepared to make a guess at a long phrase, even though they know only one letter. But then he makes a most amazing statement that almost knocked me out of my socks. In the sort of mid uh, 20th century, um, Feynman, Schwinger, Tomonaga, Dyson, and more, most particularly a guy named Ken Wilson came up with a program called renormalization theory. Renormalization theory effectively taught us if you have a flawed theory, um, how to make sure that the flaws don't infect all of your answers. So as long as you have a flaw in mm. theory, make sure that you have like a flaw, a flaw in the numerator and the exact same flaw in the denominator. And whatever that flaw is, you may not be able to discern it, but at least you can cancel it. This, uh, this trick, in some sense, uh, humbled the physicists. And they started to realize that all of their theories were sort of trapped within an energy regime. And they were afraid to guess outside of their energy regime because Wilson taught them what could be, what could be lurking. If you ever watch like Wheel of Fortune, you know, they, they spin the wheel and they have to guess mm-hmm. you know, like a phrase and you see a very long phrase and somebody says, is there a P? And there is a P and says, can I guess? You're like, well, you only have one letter. She says, look before you leap. 
oh my God, that's true. <laughs> um, we've got to guess. And the physicists learned the wrong lesson, in my opinion, which is uh, it's not enough to determine the answer. And I actually think uh, the dear Lord that you and I don't believe in uh, has left a large number of clues that are mm. sort of subtle. Wow. Did that surprise you as much as it surprised me? I actually think the dear Lord that you and I don't believe in has left a large number of clues that are subtle. What would Lewontin say to that? Sabina Hossenfelder also had something to say about those guessy theories. The key justification for using a theory for the evolution of the universe is that it has to be simple. It has to be a simple explanation for the observations that we have today. So um, what physicists have done um, to replace this problem with the singularity of the Big Bang is that um, they have replaced part of this evolution law early in the universe. So you take the normal Big Bang theory up to a certain moment in time, uh, depends on exactly how you want to do it, then you add a different evolution law and you uh, use this evolution law to go back uh, further in time. This gives you a different initial state and it can get rid of the singularity uh, and it can, can have uh, all kinds of other uh, consequences. So um, you change the equations and then, as I said, you'll always get an initial state that then fits together with those equations to give you uh, what we actually observe. And there are lots of different theories that have come out of this. For example, there may not have been a big bang, um, there might have been a big bounce. So um, there was an earlier universe which contracted uh, and then it didn't go to a singularity, but it just shrunk to a very small size and then it began to expand again. There could be cycles. Um, Roger Penrose, for example, uh, has uh, a model for a cyclic uh, cosmology. Um, there's an idea that's called um, asymptotic silence, where basically the early universe uh, was just sitting there for a really, really long time, not doing anything, and then suddenly it decided it would expand. <coughs> this also gets rid of the singularity. Um, there's uh, the no boundary proposal from um, Hartlett Hawking, uh, where you basically get rid of time entirely, so there's only space, um, four dimensions of space. Um, some think maybe there was neither space nor time, there was just uh, a pre-geometric phase, maybe some kind of a big network um, that had to condense into a form where it would give rise to something that approximates space-time to a very good precision, five-dimensional black holes, string gases, and so on and so forth. It's a, it's a really long list. But those ideas all work the same way. You change the evolution law somewhere back in time, and then you have a different uh, initial state. It's obvious that plenty of theorists have realised that the Big Bang is dead in the water and they're trying to think up alternatives. It doesn't seem to matter how ludicrous those alternatives are. There was no such thing as time, just four-dimensional space. There were five-dimensional black holes. There were just string gases. It's also very interesting that it's not just the evolutionists who are saying, if there's another theory, we'll take it. Claudia Mariston, a theoretical physicist from the University of Portsmouth, seems to be saying exactly the same thing. That's why we have to abandon the Big Bang. I think everyone is keen to abandon a theory if there is a better alternative. The situation with the Big Bang is very like it was with evolution when Stephen Jay Gould proposed punctuated equilibrium. Everyone had realised that all of the current versions of evolution were utterly disproved. But the best in the field dictum didn't allow it to be admitted publicly. Gould was absolutely confident that he solved the problem, and punk eek became very popular. I gave a number of lectures on evolution at the Russian Academy of Science. One year, 
a professor stood up and proclaimed that Gould had solved all the problems and evolution was now on a firm footing. Punk Eek collapsed soon after. And everybody, including Gould, had to go back to the theory they all knew was false. Well, we now have a scientist, Eric Lerner, who has a theory based on plasma, which is at least credible, just as Gould's theory was. Some of his theory might be true, and there's a chance that he could push the Big Bang out. We'll just have to wait and see. But Lerner is at least being given a platform to speak on, and that in itself shows how great is the dissatisfaction with the Big Bang. The crisis in cosmology that has been developing over the past several years is because increasingly the Big Bang's predictions are being contradicted by better and better data. The situation in the past few years has become so extreme that in the published literature, the predictions are in contradiction with at least 16 separate data sets and are only in agreement with one, the deuterium uh, abundance. This situation has been made much worse over the summer as the spectacular images from the James Webb Space Telescope have become uh, available. Among other problems, the Space Telescope has shown images that were surprisingly small, surprising to Big Bang cosmologists. And if taken in the context of the Big Bang hypothesis, imply impossibly small galaxies with the mass and luminosity of our own Milky Way, but with one hundredth the radius, impossible to develop into present day large galaxies. In contrast, the alternative, which is an evolving but not expanding universe, has made a sequence of correct predictions, including our prediction of Ricardo, Scarpa, and mine, of the exact size of the JWST images before the images were available. Science is about predicting things before they happen. Since we're talking about an observational science in which we're observing things we can't experiment with, we're talking about predicting observations before they occur. Now, what's been happening with the Big Bang Theory is you have an observation that contradicts a prediction quantitatively. And this was true, for example, with the discovery of the microwave background. It was predicted to be 50 degrees K, it turned out to be 3 degrees K. Well, that's an error of about a factor of 10,000 in energy. It's a little off. But they adjusted the theory. Inflation was another adjustment because the original theory of this cosmic microwave background, they figured out, would not give an even sky, but one that was completely uh, hopscotch. So they had to add inflation to tweak the theory. Well, the difference between making predictions beforehand and making adjustments afterhand is sort of like this. If you're getting on an airplane to go across the Atlantic and the airline says, well, we've had 16 crashes out of the last 17 flights, but after each crash, we were unable to totally understand why the plane crashed. But you say the next plane crashed, and they said yes. Well. I don't think any of us would get on that airline. Well, there are other aspects of science which came under scrutiny in the Institute of Art and Ideas presentations. Next time, we'll have a look at some of them and at presentations which show some of the reasons for science getting into the mess it's in. Thank you for joining me for this episode. If you enjoyed it, Please like, subscribe and press the bell so that you'll be notified as I release new movies. If you'd like to support this project, you're welcome to do so through Patreon. Find a link on my channel banner and in the description below.